comes out tonight, that you will address your comments in writing uh, to the planning office and care director report, um, who is also in attendance, by the way. Um, so that's kind of open whether or not we'll take public comment tonight. Um, I think uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna try to organize ourselves around topics. Uh, we have a list of them, and we'll go through them one at a time. We have no uh, illusions about getting through all of them tonight. They're a multi, uh, multifaceted, each one's a multifaceted question. And um, we will start with the first one, and the plan is to organize ourselves so that we don't just randomly talk and don't end up anywhere, is to ask each member up here at the table, planning board and city councilors, to comment for up to two minutes, if they care to, on the topic. When we've gone through everybody, we will then come back and have an open discussion um, and try to come to some conclusion with the information we have with us tonight um, as to where we stand on the issue before we move on to the next one. Director Port is here for um, some any information that he might have that he can help us with, but we really want to keep it with the um, council and the board to share our ideas and see how close we are on issues and how close we can get to some sort of, um, feel, I'll just call it feeling comfortable with some results. We're not gonna take any strong votes, we're not gonna you know, um, hold our feet to the on anything, but we need to make some progress, and that's the right plan for tonight. I'm sorry, there was a question?
Collins and follows that. Um, the massing, I feel um, the issue of the step backs from the third floor up is the most important part of the massing. So we do not get the canyon effect of walking through five story buildings. Um, so I think that's really all I have to say on that. Uh, thank you. Um, I very much agree with um, the comments to have uh, 35 foot buildings near the waterfront. Um, I like the idea of if we are to go beyond three story buildings, we consider four story with a four story setback. Um, I do not support the type of height on buildings, uh, including on that next to it. Um, I think that the, for me, the uh, project scope is very, very dense. And I think that density might come down as we consider other issues, such as open space and true open space not rooftop space or parking space or other kind of space. Um, oh, and also parking. I know that the planning office has commissioned a peer review of the uh, parking study that was submitted by the developer. Uh, I'm still not sure that the proposal that's been put forth has sufficient parking on site for either residents or certainly the uh, retail. Um, I guess I certainly would defer to other members of the planning board regarding um, resiliency issues. Um, and maybe my colleague Rick Painter is one of them, and uh, he'll be next. Thank you. This is actually uh, where I spent most of my time. I actually have some very specific recommendations here. Uh, it's important, I think, to incorporate sea level rise in future flooding scenarios. Uh, and that means pushing the floors of the building up to the, the levels that are currently proposed out of the zoning that we propose to have. And also to maintain the building height and the scale of the buildings in the downtown the waterfront. So it's pushing up from the bottom and pushing down from the top. Uh, the building and site design, I think that the uh, zoning has to specify the vertical separation from future flood levels horizontal separation from the river to mitigate wave damage. Um, so I, I think that this should assume project life is 100 years because you know, the buildings last a long time, so it shouldn't be designed just for 30 or 50 years. Uh, my proposal is to uh, make the minimum elevation of the first floor six feet above the current uh, FEMA base flow elevation. So right now the ground proposes two feet above the base flow elevation. Various studies have projected 60 of sea level rise in the next 100 years, including a brand new study from the University of New Hampshire and the Coast of Hampshire, and also uh, from the Brazilians Committee back in February, also looking at 60. So that's what I think we should be at. So right now, just to put that in perspective, you know, the area of the uh, site that is near the river right now is at Public open space throughout the site should be designed so they're not flooded in the 100 year scenario. And so that to me means adding about three feet of fill. Uh, again, the, the specifics are in my, uh, the specific, specific numbers are in my uh, proposal, but uh, right now the, the, the elevation, is, as I said, is eight. We'd be raising it to elevation 11. Um, we have to figure out how the uh, the flood, right now there's a flood, what's called a flood mitigation study, and all it talks about really is moving cars and, and sheltering in place. 
And I think there needs to be a more forward-looking analysis that projects the site conditions at the mean high water with six feet of, of sea level rise. Um, right now, the fourth item is building height. And the, right now, the, in the, zone, the way the zoning is written, there are two, two or three major loopholes in, uh, in the zoning. One uh, adds to the building height the, the flood level. So it adds um, three to five feet to the flood level. So a 45-foot building is really a 48 to 50-foot building. Uh, the second one uh, measures height from Merrimack Street for a building that fronts on Merrimack Street. And so a, a very long building, such as shown on Ned's plans, could be up to 20 feet higher than the nominal 45-foot limit. And then there's no, um, no uh, requirement at all for something on the roof. So the roof could be completely covered with, uh, with uh, mechanicals, uh, screening, and so forth. So I've got recommendations here. But basically, my recommendation is for a building that fronts on Merrimack Street, uh, that it be essentially at the same, the maximum height be no higher than Horton's Yard. Uh, and that would be, go back to the back of Horton's Yard. Uh, and beyond that, um, we'd be talking about a building that is at it's, it's 50 feet elevation, which is really 50 feet minus um, 9 or 10 feet, so more like a 40-foot building back there. And so the result of this would require um, a building height of basically um, 39 feet at the river uh, when you're raising it from the current ground elevation. Uh, but it, the actual habitable height would be 31 feet. So we're talking about a, a three-story building at the maximum. OK, so I agree with a lot of what Rick had to say. Um, I do think that 55 feet is too high. Um, and I agree with Rick that there are too many exceptions and adjustments to the building height. Um, and that it allows for the actual buildings to be much higher than what one would think reading um, the ordinance. Um, so I would think a 45 foot max um, and that there should be fewer adjustments or no adjustments. Um, you know, utilities on the roof, if they're over a certain size, should be included. Um, I think it may be preferable to base the building heights on a standard elevation um, or a top to bottom measurement uh, rather than including things like the FEMA separations as an offset. Uh, I think it would be more straightforward. Um, I think that from the model that we have, it's um, or the renderings that we have, it is hard to tell from the model whether the re what the relative building heights will look like. Um, I'm not sure if they're to scale. Some of them, the 55 foot at Merrimack Street looks like the same height as Horton's Yard, which I think is quite a bit um, shorter. Uh, as far as density, I do think that it is too dense at this point. Um, I don't think that the proposal really replicates the density and the massing of the historic downtown. I feel like it looks a lot more dense. Um, and it, I'm afraid that the buildings are going to look like high rises and that the walkways are going to be um, these narrow alleys. Uh, I think there should be some maximum building coverage, other um, sorts of constraints on the density put into the zoning. Uh, from if it is non-discretionary, and I think that's to be talked about later, but right now I feel like there is a lot of flexibility um, to change a proposal up. Um, and so I think we need to put more in the actual ordinance. Uh, and then with respect to sea level rise, in my mind, um, this is the most important issue for a development um, located in the waterfront west. Uh, I would propose that we add an item on the purposes about promoting sustainable development principles uh, and incorporating storm resiliency and adaptation. Uh, I think that we need to be looking, like Rick said, at a 75 to 100 year range um, for life of the buildings and the project. Um, so, I also would think that a six foot above um, 
the FEMA base flood elevation is something we should incorporate. Um, and I do think it should be occupied floors, not residential. Uh, I think, you know, having the commercial space and the retail space flood is not going to be good for the city. Uh, I agree with Rick that the buildings that are now proposed closest to the water should be set further inland. Uh, I think we should make sure we're incorporating the most up-to-date standards as far as building codes and utilities in the floodplain. Um, and then I do wonder, I don't know if it's possible, but can we incorporate a requirement for landscaping that will provide some more resiliency, either a berm or a catchment or something like that in the open space or closer to the water, um, just to give some extra protection. Uh, right now the diagrams show everything pretty much hardscaped, uh, and I don't think that that's the best choice for that location. Uh, and I agree that with some of the comments that I read that there should be some thought about parking um, if and when the parking that they're providing on site becomes unusable. So those are my thoughts. Um, I, I agree with my colleagues on, um, on the, the sea level rise and the flood hazard mitigation. Um, I am not an expert, and so I, I defer to their expertise there. As far as the height goes, I, I actually don't have a problem with the height as it's written. Um, if you look at the map up here, you can see that the blue area is the area where it would be 55 feet. Um, the green area is 45 feet, and Andy, tell me if this is wrong, and then 35 feet at the closer to the, to the river. And I think that, that with that, I think that's a very small area that's 55 feet, and there are a lot of buildings in our downtown that are 55 feet. Um, and I think that there's, if we, if we want to um, make the property or project look in some ways less dense, I think by going higher and adding in some architectural elements, we could then have more open space and a more space between buildings and, and have it not seem so dense with building. Um, so I'm not afraid of, of adding some height, especially along Merrimack Street. I do think that we need um, more clarification on where that height is taken from, as, as um, the other members have said. Uh, so I think that that's, you know, that's something to think about. Um, <clears throat> and so those are my main comments. I don't want to repeat anything else that was said. Uh, I think my comments are more that the uh, original Waterfront West Overlay District um, captured the concerns, at least that I heard, raised by the public comments over the past two years. So um, that type of density is more along the lines that um, I'm looking at. Um, I agree with uh, some of the height, allowing higher than the uh, 35 feet in areas to uh, add variation and make it interesting. But um, so that's my main comments on the density. I uh, want to thank Rick for bringing up the uh, uh, idea of adding fill to the area. That was something that was raised at the ad hoc committee. And um, uh, I also am very much in support of uh, the city um, being consistent with the various studies and documents that are published on the website regarding resiliency and sustainability, and that we actually uh, try to build this for the long range, uh, 100 years as well. So I'm not going to repeat what others have said, but just say that I agree with the 100 year time frame and that um, we should be really focusing on more resilient building for the whole site. Um, I'm curious about the infill again, I mean infill, sorry, the fill, um, because I'm not an expert about this, but I do think the elevations, uh, considering the fluctuating, what will be over time fluctuating FEMA maps and levels um, of concern, um, can't allow, would not allow us to have an absolute um, base that we should put a number in. That in other words, it should the the building should be related to the changing conditions out there. And if fill allows us to do that, then that would be a good idea. My concern about that is that if we fill on this site, we may be causing trouble for off-site on the other parcels nearby. So if there's a way to um, mitigate uh, flow from this site to other sites, that should be considered. 
Obviously, this would be during a storm surge. Everybody's going to be, all the parcels are going to be, you know, suffering from the storm surge. But certainly when it uh, recedes, there should, should not be um, additional um, problems on uh, other parcels, abutting parcels, because we've allowed Phil here to raise the buildings. But that does speak to the point of um, having what was called a sacrificial level. And I think we're, I haven't heard anybody talk about the parking yet, but it's possible that the parking may still remain on a level where um, you won't be able to get to your cars if it's, if it's too wet. Um, and in that sense, there should be some sort of what's called wet flood proofing um, to allow the water to flow through the areas where um, parking is allowed. Um, I'm for a variety of heights, but I'm more visual. And so I think of it in terms of what is it viewed in context. So without going, I don't know um, that I can say specific numbers, 55 or 45 or whatever it should be, but rather that the streetscape should be consistent with what's already there and moving toward the river, taking advantage of the slope to put more levels into those buildings where we might be able to get more um, density because the uh, topography allows for it. I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I'll start with sea level rise. That's where we started on the uh, ad hoc uh, last November. Um, I think we can all agree we want buildings to last at least 50 years, and that's, that's really the minimum. Um, the question is, what do we expect uh, in the longer horizon? Of course, the longer you draw at the horizon of time, the harder it is to predict how much rise uh, in the sea there's going to be. Uh, but I do want to note that we got comments from both the Resilience Committee, which is a committee of volunteers, and the conservation agent for the city uh, for the same six feet. Uh, above flood level, um, FEMA flood level that um, uh, Rick Tainer and many of the board members have suggested. So I think we should study that. I will tell you that at the ad hoc, the reason we did not go with that um, was um, uh, the residential floors will comply. That doesn't seem to be a problem at all. It was the uh, commercial space and we were worried that um, because of the, the need to have uh, floor to ceiling heights at a certain uh, amount that it just wouldn't, the math didn't work. So I'm still unclear on that, but obviously the policy is correct. You know, we, if we really are expecting a six foot um, sea level rise, we got a plan for that. Uh, setbacks, um, I think it was noted in the uh, planning director's report. I mean, that's, that's a, a drafting error. I mean, I wrote the uh, ad hoc report at 20 feet separation um, and I transcribed it in the opening draft of what later became the ordinance as uh, 10. That's just an error. Um, the percentage of open space, I just want to caution people that uh, the existing waterfront West Overlay District language really is not that great. Um, it says 33% uh, of essentially uh, open space, but then it defines open space to include things like public restrooms. So. Let's let's just sort of figure out a ground plane and then derive how we want to define the number. Uh, on heights, I mean, I'm not I'm not categorically opposed to to uh, buildings of 55 feet, but um, obviously the language in the in the draft uh, is is not what we envision at the ad hoc, and and it doesn't match the diagram either, as I think um, Board Member Harford pointed out. Which is only the only really uh, building over 50 feet was was going to be the one next to Horton's Yard. It would also be helpful to shoot a laser to the top of Horton's Yard from the Merrimack side to know what that height is, because I I guess I'm confused. Uh, on horiz I'm almost done. On horizontal separation, I we that did come up. Um, Rick uh, Tainer did raise that at the ad hoc last year, and I I I, I still have not heard any real rationale for that. Um, why you would set all buildings back 150 feet. I mean, that kind of implies uh, a retreat from the waterfront for all of Newburyport that I just don't think is consistent. I think if they can build to a standard such as Boston is now requiring in their recent guidelines, it's okay to build um, near the water. You just have to design rigorous, uh, rigorously. It can be done. Um, 
adding Phil, yeah, that did come up. Uh, James Berger did, did mention that and, and fought hard for that. And we raised that with the Conservation Commission, at least informally, and they really were adamant that they would never approve uh, Phil on this site. Maybe they could change their mind, but I, I, I share the concern of, of Chair Sontag that all you do by adding fill is displace the water to the other sides. And it's just nobody wins. It never ends. I, I would not recommend that. Um, <clears throat> uh, and then as far as you know, the word sacrificial is used, I mean, let's, let's be honest. The, the, the Peter Matthews boardwalk that we have is, is going to flood, you know, so you know, you have to you have to make decisions in land use. You, we cannot uh, raise up the entire city six feet. Um, so I, you know, I'm not as concerned about, I, I don't think it's appropriate to require all the open spaces to be jacked up six feet in the air. Yes, they'll flood, you know, St. Mark's Square in Venice floods. Um, one thing I want to mention, because he's not on the board anymore, is Rishi Nandi, a former member. He was really uh, pushing for a wake, uh, sorry, a wave attenuator, um, and that would be a way to to mitigate um, the storm surge and, and storm action. Um, so I, I don't want to forget to mention that. Thanks. Sure. Um, just a couple of quick thoughts on here. It uh, was nice uh, in the first meeting that we had to hear from the public and I uh, got a lot of good notes and thoughts from folks that came to that and I appreciate that and now we have a chance to listen to the planning board and get their perspective on that so gaining more notes putting this all together but um, you know pretty much what I've got out of this so far and, it, and I think it, it is aligns to what I've read and what I've seen is um, we have a height problem. It is definitely too high. Um, the public made a comment, uh, someone in the public made a comment about it being like cavernous in between the buildings, and I would certainly agree that, that that's what would happen here. Uh, I'm not 100% sure if we've seen a 3D view, but I, I know that that's continuously asked for to see what this would would look like um, from a vision of somebody on the street level. So um, we hope to see that soon. Um, the density is obviously, um, it is too dense. And I think that's, that's bothering a lot of folks in the, in the public. We keep hearing that. Um, Bonnie mentioned parking issues. Nobody's, nobody's took a stab at it yet. But um, you know, when you start to do the parking numbers here and add them all up, you can see that they, they, don't, uh, they don't add up. And just one of my personal thoughts on this, and I'll just throw it out there, because it really has nothing to do with what's on this list is, you know, what do you really want to see on this site? Basically, this is a residential neighborhood in an urban setting with a little tiny bit of commercial um, and possibly a hotel, but it's currently a commercial area. And I guess the big question is, is do you want all your commercial to go away? Do you want this to become a residential neighborhood? Because that's what's being proposed here in all this. And I think when you look back to the 2003, 2004 overlay, they were trying to get a little bit more commercial out of it, maybe get more of a balance out of it. This doesn't appear to be much of a balance. This appears to be um, the development of a neighborhood. Um, to me, I'm not necessarily um, for that idea. I think there definitely should be a, more of a combination of the two. Um, when we had our ad hoc committee, one of my comments was is if you were at um, the Black Cow, what would be your reason to get to Michael's? What would bring you across the waterfront? If there's no amenities, if there's nothing to catch your eye, if there's no shops to pop into, or you know, what would get you to the other side? If you didn't know Newburyport, you came here for the first time. Uh, I'm just, I just throw that question out there, and that's the danger of it being too much residential. Is are you going to activate the area? Are you going to get people through the waterfront? And uh, I would say if I was NED, I most certainly would want to do that. And if I was proposing to put a hotel all the way at the other side, I would want to make things that would want to draw people through that development. Um, but I don't actually see that here. Um, so I, I question that personally. I, I do think there should be more commercial in it. 
Um, as far as sea rise and things like that, that's not my expertise. I'll continue to listen to the folks that that is their expertise, uh, especially with energy efficiency and things like that. We're continuing to get more and more information from folks in the city that are experts in those type of things. And I'm taking all that in and, and, you know, and categorizing it all and cataloging it just so I have that information. Thank you. Who, who am I? <laughs> well, he was Larry. Larry Junta, Ward 5 City Council. And I'm Heather Shan, the Ward 3 City Councilor. So this is the Ward this is Ward 3. So I've heard from a lot of the constituents who live in the area and I appreciate all the comments that have been given in the last few days. There's certainly been a lot of thoughtful ones. Um, as far as resiliency goes, I do agree we should be building for the long haul, much like the rest of Newburyport. We have many buildings in this town that are over 200 years old, and I don't think we should be designing for something that's not going to make it for 50 years. I think we should be looking at the 7,500 year range. Um, as far as the, the fill goes, I do have share the same concerns that uh, Bonnie does with having water being displaced. I think that would be a concern. I think we should you know, be cognizant of the areas around this location. I don't think we should be trying to flood out other areas. Like Councilor Igerman said, we can't raise the whole community six feet. That would be tough. Um, as far as height goes, uh, I do think having the taller buildings closer to Merrimack is okay. I like Rick's comment about keeping it the same height as Horton's yard for consistency. I do have concerns with the hike going further towards the river, though. I think there are some things about the old overlay district, overlay zoning that um, should remain. I think the 35 feet is one of them. Uh, and I will agree with my fellow counselor to my right here that mixed use is important. I think there should be something that draws people to this area, and I think it should be part of the, you know, the rail trail connects this, so this should be something that People want to be drawn to walk away f to the waterfront west, or, I'm sorry, to the water, central waterfront and then to the rail trail to the other side, but it should be, it shouldn't be a gated community. It should be part of our community. It should not be a subset of it. So my two cents. Thank you. Uh, my name is Sharif Zeed. I'm the Ward 1 City Councilor. Um, I I've been... <clears throat> kind of sitting around at night thinking about this since last Thursday on top of all the other time spent on the ad hoc and so forth. And for me, I, I have to back up and try and think about what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Why are we here? Why are we having this conversation? And it seems like there's sort of three things that are common. Number one is, you know, the city may change zoning in order to leverage a public benefit of some kind. And I've, I won't even venture to define public benefit. There are several different groups with different ideas about what the public benefit could or should be. They range from um, everything you can think of, traffic improvements, public infrastructure improvements, um, just the value of developing the site. For some, it's a hotel. There's all kinds of public benefits. The second one is that the city may be able to get some additional control over the development by sort of making a deal. So in other words, we will change the zoning, but in exchange, for example, we will ask for this master development plan. And the third one may be that, you know, there may be some that think the zoning is inherently unfair or unreasonable, whomever the landowner is. Those are the three things I've been hearing from different people. The, the problem I'm having is that the, the goals are starting to run counter to each other. So in other words, some people want the buildings to be higher off the ground, but then they don't want the, others don't want the height to exceed a certain amount. Some people want to extract such a huge public benefit that it's requiring the landowner to propose something that basically has to add margin in order to support those, and that's leading to all kinds of friction, I think, between these different things. And so then I said, let me throw all that out the window because who cares? The number one reason we have zoning is, I think, which everybody would hopefully agree on, is that we want to sort of maintain the quality and character of Newburyport, which is very difficult to define, but generally everybody has a sense. And when, when people get offended, when they see something too tall or too dense, they get offended. That's what we're talking about when we say maintain the quality. So go to 10 people and say, what do you think of this? So. The, and, and, and I think that's backed up, and I, I don't know if most would agree, but the feedback I've re received has been overwhelmingly negative. Uh, it just is there's, there's hard to find a positive comment in the pile. So my point is that um, th this all leads me to my conclusion, which I, I don't think this, I'm going to probably take one of the strongest positions tonight, which maybe isn't advisable, but I don't think the zoning is in the ballpark. We're sort of, you know, we're starting to get down into like punch list things, but we're not even close on the basics. 
I was reading Andy Port's memo uh, as much as I could today and looking at how the project has moved from 100 and something units, now we're up to 200. Seems like we're going in the wrong direction, at least from my perspective. People are asking us, lower it, shrink it, make it smaller, make it reasonable. Respectfully, what that also means is that our expectations on the public benefit have to recede with that as well. And so, as, your, as a city councilor, maybe yours, maybe not, I, I can't deliver to you everything. I wish that I could, but I can't do that. And so, if we're going to continue this discussion, um, I, I do think that we need to focus on the city's interests and delineate where those city interests end and where the private landowner's interests begin, because it's not clear to me, for example, Requiring a six foot over FEMA may be a good idea for resiliency, but you will detract away from the, the quality of the project, which is, gets into that intangible of, the, of sort of how you view Newburyport and do you want something nice. We have witnessed this firsthand um, in other areas. There's a fixed amount of sort of profit, let's be honest, it's a fixed amount of public benefit that can be delivered on a project, and it is our role and our responsibility to prioritize how that public benefit may be spent, and we just can't have it all. So what I think is, if we're going to continue the discussion, we need to think about what the city interests are and where those end. To me, they're public safety, public infrastructure, things along those lines, density, character, quality. Those are the things I think about. Um, if, if it, you know, and, and I do draw the line at some point where the landowner does have to take some risk if something gets flooded, perhaps. That's, that's not always our problem, and we need to be focused on the things that are. So I can't speak to whether six feet makes sense or four feet, but I can say that if we're going to have everything, we may end up with, with nothing. Now, to be fair and respectful to the sponsor who, who took the time to put this in, uh, there are some specific comments I have. I'm very unclear about how we measure height. I think that was mentioned. We're arguing about what the height should be, but it doesn't actually seem like we're all on board with how we're measuring height. Uh, we received some testimony about that last year. There's a question about datums, question about roof appurtenances. This is not my line of work, but I understand the terminology well enough to know that if we don't agree on how we measure, it doesn't matter what we may agree on to what the measurement might be. Number two is um, I am wholly opposed to any sort of parking requirement that doesn't require two spaces per market rate unit. I've made that position clear on other projects. I'm being consistent here. This is the new age. People have two cars, don't have two, you can't have two spaces for, you, you, you have a problem. The cars have to go somewhere. I represent a tight ward. I know that they usually end up in the street, and then that usually ends up with 52 voicemails at my house. So I'm very personally aware of how that goes. Number three is I hate shared parking. I think some planning board members may disagree with me, perhaps strongly on that, but I, um, I just don't believe those old adages work anymore as they may be used to. People telecommute now. People are just home. It's not like both cars leave in the morning as they used to, come back. There have been some improvements on that here, but it's been troubling. I don't believe in shared open space. It's either open and it's available or it's not. It's, it can't be a parking lot and a park. It's one thing or the other. And so mixing the two, I'd, I'd rather have less, for example, but true open space than I would to sort of mix the two together and then try and make the claim that it's both. The last thing is I think this, the setbacks and the street widths need to be identified better. Street widths are important for a variety of reasons, not just to open the development up a little bit, but also um, to keep it reasonable. So my suggestion is, because I don't feel this is in the ballpark, I, I think we actually, if we want to continue the discussion, we probably should think about going to the existing Waterfront West Overlay District and making some targeted changes if some are necessary and take it from there instead of maybe reimagining this entire thing when we keep ending up right back at, at step one. Those are my comments. Sorry, it's a little more than two minutes, but we've been kind of pent up here not to speak, so I needed a chance to do it. Thank you for your time. Charlie Tonto, uh, Ward 4. <clears throat> um, you know, when I, I look at this project, I'm influenced by, by um, what Chris Scoville said uh, during Preservation Week. Uh, he is uh, president of uh, the Boston uh, Preservation Alliance, and uh, he gave the keynote speech for pres during uh, keynote speech during Preservation Week. And what he, what he said, the Boston Preservation Alliance increasingly is doing when they look at a uh, a development is they focus less uh, on on the dimensional aspects of it, and they ask the question, how does this project fit in with the rest of the city? Uh, how does it impact the sense of place in the city? So when I look at this project, that's the question I ask. Not not just how it's going to affect this this you know acreage in this particular spot, but how will it affect uh, 
every, people who live in in Ward Six and Ward Five and Ward One. I mean, it, it it we have a sense of place here in Newburyport. It's developed historically, and uh, and any major development of this scale potentially poses poses a threat to that sense of space, uh, sense of place. And uh, I hear that from a lot of people to, who speak to me. Um, my, my point of departure on this is density. Uh, and I think uh, they're the just, I mean, uh, it started with 145 units, it then went to 230, now it's down to 215. Uh, I think too, that's too many. And, and, and one of the indicators of too many uh, is is that the distance between the building at Horton's Yard and the next building only being 10 feet, all right? And, and I've lived in Manhattan, and, uh, and I do believe I'd looked out my window at a wall 10 feet away. And, and uh, you know, I was willing to do that because it was Manhattan. And, and Newburyport's a wonderful place, <laughs> but I don't, think, I don't think we're there yet. Um, and, and I certainly wouldn't want to have stayed in that apartment in New York for... Uh, 20 years, 30 years. Um, so, so that's one, I think the density has to come down. Secondly, uh, I really, uh, people have mentioned it before, um, the, the desire for a 3D uh, representation of this. Um, the, you know, I, I, I took those photo simulations and I put them on my giant 27 inch screen desktop at home and I zoomed right in because what I was interested in is, is looking at the ways to the water. All right, and and I'm I'm looking, and uh, I really didn't get a good good picture of it or a good sense because even 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 when I enlarged it and got close to it, I was able to see uh, what that first first floor looks like, and I'm concerned about uh, you know even at two feet because there'd be parking there, but I'd like to be able to look up. I'd like to be able to get a sense of what it's going to be like to walk down there. Uh, because what we'd like, I think, is, the, is, as other people have said, this not to be a gated community. We'd like it to be welcoming. And I think, I think you know, the architect uh, for the developer in, in, in the, um, when he was talking about the, I think it was the, uh, the fingers going down to the river and the ways, um, he said the idea was to make it welcome. It was to make it a sense so people want to go down, walk down to the river. Uh, and, you know, I don't necessarily think it needs to be a commercial ent enterprise somewhere down there to get you to the river. I think the river in itself, if you can see it, uh, is, is a draw, all right? Um, so finally, on resiliency, uh, I, I think my, my uh, contribution to that is, is concern in the, I mean, the, the 2050 is, is a turn point. Uh, I mean, there are some variables. Uh, we clearly have about 10 years as, as, as a race to uh, address it, uh, and all bets are off. Uh, but around 2050, which is not going to be my problem in all probability, it's going to be some, well, maybe some of your problems, but uh, it's going to be the future's problem. Uh, and, and I think it gets, it, it, it gets a, sorry about that, right? You'll be here, right? <laughs> I, I think... Um, uh, and I think it's, it's, it's going to be spotty. There are going to be periods of time from what, from, you know, I'm an environmental economist. I'm not a scientist by any means. Uh, I know the literature. I've taught this stuff. And, and uh, it, it, you know, seacoast communities are going to have a tough time overall. And my concern is that whatever is built there, that it not add to the difficulty. I think this community made a mistake when uh, we did not move the wastewater treatment plant. We have it right on the river. When that decision was made, we probably should have put it someplace else. Uh, resiliency and responding to it wasn't, wasn't high on the priorities, but I think now that we know a lot more, uh, it should be a higher priority. The new council. Thank you, Chief McCauley, uh, Councilor at Large. Uh, I want to uh, thank the number of people who took time uh, to send me a note uh, and um, share their thoughts and opinions. I truly appreciate it. Um, now that I'm sitting on this side of the table, um, people talk at me as opposed to um, sometimes talking with me when I sat on that side of the table. Um, but uh, I, I too, I'm going to continue a trend here that I'm not going to talk about the dimensional aspects of things because there's people who do this for a living and are 
uh, much more versed in this. Um, but I am going to talk about density, and it's what I'm hearing loud and clear from uh, uh, people who have taken the time to talk to me about it. I'm talking about people density. And that is one of the driving factors on all of this discussion. There's too many people. Uh, if you take the people out, then the parking solves itself. If you, take the, if you reduce the people, then the heights get less, and the buildings can be uh, more comfortable in our neighborhood. Um, a, a quick, um, unscientific, I will admit, a study says that the, um, the bedroom count uh, in this new um, proposal is the equivalent of taking um, the population of Federal Street on both sides and a portion of Lime Street on one side and compressing it into two square acres. And that has incredible amount of pressure on the quality of life um, that is that we've all been talking about, right? We're not talking. I, I don't. I don't care how tall the buildings are if there's too many people in there, right? That that's kind of what I'm hearing. So it it impacts parking, it impacts traffic, it impacts water and sewer, it impacts uh, restaurants, it impacts any commercial activity, it impacts every single thing we do. And so I'm just adding my perspective based upon what people have said, um, and I would uh, support. Um, uh, uh, the recommendations that we look at the original and build up from that as opposed to trying to hit a moving target. Um, we're trying to help the developer hit their sweet spot. They're trying to hit their sweet spot. Um, everybody's hitting the optimize button and we don't necessarily as residents get the benefit of that doubt. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, my name is Barry Connell. I'm counselor at large and uh, currently serving as president of the council. And um, my fingerprints are on this because uh, my name is on it. Um, first, I want to respond to something um, Councillor Tantar said uh, about his own mortality. I don't know about you, I plan on living forever. I have no intention of dying before this is done. Uh, on the other hand, I probably won't have uh, much to say about that. Um, it's just going to happen. Uh, I do want to say something uh, about the original um, zoning overlay that we placed here in, uh, it was it 2004? Um, I, I believe I'm the only councillor sitting now, at least at this table, who was here to vote for that. And there were really four elements of it, based on our vision at that time. Um, let's remind ourselves. One was that the footprint that could be developed be no more dense than the rest of the commercial downtown area. Um, second, that all buildings be publicly accessible at the ground level, and that there be a commitment toward open space or public access, publicly used spaces on the site that was consistent with what we've come to expect on our central waterfront and on the aprons to both sides and, and sometimes back into the community itself. Uh, think about Market Square and the N Street Mall. There are public spaces there, and we like that, and we're used to that. Third was that we anticipated all parking would be contained on the site. We didn't want satellite parking. We weren't going to build a parking garage for anyone. We weren't going to give someone access to our parking garage in order to make the parking uh, requirements uh, on site work for them. And that remains, I believe. And fourth, uh, we were going to lean heavily upon the planning board, which has considerable expertise in this area, that the, that the visual characteristics of a development here have to be consonant with what we expect Newburyport to be. And that's a very subjective thing. And I'm not the person to do that. But I think the planning board is, is well equipped to, to make some of those judgments. So following the ad hoc, and this is how many years down the road, um, I think those original uh, conditions uh, kind of worked as a placeholder for us so we could get to where we are today. Nothing dramatic has happened. We have a lot of um, concepts that have been thrown around, and I think the planning board has, has very capably um, either blown some up or modified some or accepted others uh, as concepts have been put forward. We're at a different place now. 
what the ad hoc committee did was look through our, you know, perspective, respective lenses at what could happen here and create several bands of development based on height, but that's not the only way to look at it. It's the way we ended up looking at it. I want to comment on a couple of specific things, but before I go too much farther, say so, and I am going to take more than the two minutes, I, I apologize to the chairs. Um, I think we heard a lot of things last week from the public, and the public was enormously thoughtful, well prepared, and useful in terms of giving us some thoughts that we had not previously had, and some advice on where we might proceed. So I want to thank you for that. A couple of those areas I want to respond to. One, and I believe a couple of previous speakers have said this, has to do with height. I'm not particularly uh, stuck on height. Uh, I don't think that 55 feet is extreme. There are other structures in the city that meet that height standard. What the big problem seems to me uh, to be is that we're used to seeing a boat yard down there. You know, and, and to the, from, from, from the base of their keel up to the top of their cabins, they might be 12, maybe 15 feet tall, some of them, if they're, they're the larger boats that are down there. So our vision of this property is skewed by our experience, what we've really enjoyed looking at. But that's no longer going to be there. What's going to be there is a new neighborhood occupied by new neighbors. And I'm, I'm not terribly concerned with the density, I think it might lighten up a little bit. Because I think this being a new neighborhood in a small city, there will be people who want something of an urban experience, a little more urban than we have in the outlying neighborhoods. We'll be attracting new people, different people, perhaps people who are moving out of single family residence who want to move in a more densely occupied area with a different a somewhat different feel to it, where they don't have to mow a lawn, they don't have to shovel the sidewalk. I guess that includes me. <laughs> Not that I want to move right now, I don't. So um, I think we have to open ourselves up to the possibility of change. It is going to be a change. None of us is going to get exactly what we want, uh, but I'd like us to be open to the possibility of change. There are a couple of other items I wanted to address here. Uh, the resiliency. I think that uh, serving on the resiliency committee, um, the six-foot recommendation that, that uh, Rick Tainter has spoken of uh, is well advised. Um, I, I do think that that is something that we should, we should adopt. Um, I thank Councillor Eigerman for pointing out the error in the calculations or in the, in the presentation about setback, uh, particularly from Horton's Yard. 10 feet is way too close, and I don't believe that that's what our ordinance currently, uh, nor in the future, would, would um, permit. Um, that having been said, um, we want to maintain the feel of Newburyport. There's an awful lot that has to take place for these developments, as we understand them, to conform to what we feel, what we value in our city. And, and I hope that we'll all keep open minds as we move forward as um, Chair Sontag said, uh, we have a long way to go. This is the last night. Thank you. Uh, Joe Devlin, I'm a counselor at large. I also served on the ad hoc uh, committee. So we spent 10, 12, maybe 15 plus hours mm -hmm. talking about this. Um, I, I I'm, I'm in the same place that Councillor Zeed is in. This isn't in the ballpark to me. I was actually debating whether I was going to come tonight because I, I'm almost feeling like this is a waste of time for me to talk about because it doesn't have my vote in, in its, in its uh, present um, state. It's, I'm going to speak on number one, which is I think how we're doing this right. We're going to go down through these, but uh, it's too high, it's too dense, uh, and there's too much mass. Um, that also correlates with just about every person who I've spoken to or who has emailed me and I've had email correspondence with or those people who have come here and spoken in public comment. Um, and I, I will say the last time, the last uh, meeting's public comment was probably the best co public comment I've heard since I've been a counselor. Um, the Lamberts in particular, I think I've heard them speak on this subject like 
800 times. And they came up with something new uh, that, that I, you know, that again, I said, gee, well, that's a good, these are people that are thinking about this. They, they have a vested interest in it, but they're thinking about it in a reasonable, rational way. Um, and I would say that that should be one of our priorities here. We do have residents here and this project greatly impacts those residents and we should do everything we can because they were here first. Um, let me say a little bit about the ad hoc on the uh, height density and massing. I don't think we came to the conclusion that we would have these uniform bands of height. I do think we came to the conclusion that, that the uh, Merrimack Street could support higher buildings because of the grade. Um, what we were talking about is different viewpoints in the city, and I think what it rested down for some of us, or came down to for some of us, is there are benefits to having an agreement with one developer to do all of this. You can get some benefits out of it. But the problem you get is you get a very uniform looking piece of const you know, construction. I keep on saying everything I see it makes it, it looks like a college campus in, no insult to Iowa, Mike, but Iowa, where you know they don't have a long history of building. It's a newly built college campus and, and it, that it doesn't fit in. We did talk in the uh, ad hoc, that's what we started out doing, was talking about the 2004 master plan and we did decide, I, I don't think the intention nor anybody wants a repli replica of State Street, because that's from a very distinctive period of time. You know, it's, you know, 1830s frozen in time. We don't necessarily need the design to be the same, but I think a bunch of us said it needs to look organic. And, and it needs, to, I, I think the bands of height are a bad idea because, you know, you, if you have some some buildings that are uh, lower on Merrimack, and then you could see through the city, that's what we like about walking down Water Street, for instance. There's a bunch of streets in the way, uh, buildings in the way. Then suddenly you come out to an open space, and you can see the river, and it's cool. It's like it's like discovering a, a secret place. So I just think there are things that we could, the, the, if the zoning could do to make it more organic looking and less blocky buildings, and the heights vary within these bands with an idea of where viewpoints are traditionally. So for instance, the rail trail off to the left of this, you got a viewpoint down 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 the, the, the harbor, you know, you might want to have some build, a building swath there that's a little bit lower. Um, one other thing that, you know, borrowing from the, because we did talk about this at the ad hoc, borrowing from, you know, the, where the um, uh, buildings would be separated from the 2004 plan, there, there was more building separation and it, was, it looked more like a city, one of our city neighborhoods, which this does not, but it also had a nice, it call, they called it Wharf Street along the water. So I, I don't know if I agree with the 150 foot setback and that there's no buildings. Um, you know, there is a state law that says you have to have some things on the waterfront for the public to enjoy. Um, but, but certainly, you know, some mixture of that. On the resiliency issue, I will say, just remember, and I really don't care about this top, like I'm not gonna fight for this topic, but it's 13 feet is what, or 12 and a half feet is what the built, where the residential would start now. And what they're talking about is adding six feet to that. And, and that's, you know, uh, Rick Tainer did bring a, a map to us of a proposed flooding at, at a certain sea level rise. No one's going to be living down there. It, it lapped over Merrimack Street, you know, and, and was, you know, at, at places was, was touching, you know, across Merrimack Street under the Route 1 bridge. So no one's, we're not going to be able to use Merrimack Street anymore if that happens. So I think that was our understanding was, look, yes, it's a problem and it's, it, you know, but it becomes the developer's problem and it becomes the people buying this. There's some risk in buying on the waterfront. But I'm not going to fall on my sword on that because I've already said that I don't. I don't think this is, this is in the ballpark or something that I even want to spend a lot of time trying to tweak. I don't think we're in the tweak phase. We're in the. We need some uh, massive overhaul. One last thing, um, we had talked about early, early on in my term as a city councilor about getting somebody, an expert, to tell us what the economic benefit 
that New England development would get out of this project. Because right now, it's like herding cats. That's why we're going from you know, certain numbers to certain numbers. We don't know what their tipping point is. You know, we've been we've been told that well we're gonna you know this could just be a 40B, but we don't know what the 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 tipping point is where they say we've had enough, we're going. So we don't know what economic benefits we can ask for as a city. So I would suggest that that's one of the things, and and I would also suggest one last thing: the development agreement and the and the economic benefits that we should get should be a contemporaneous discussion here because I won't vote on this zoning until we've had a time to vet the development agreement as well. Thank you. I guess I'm the caboose of this long train. Uh, my name's Afroz Khan. I'm a, a city councilor at large and I was also part of the ad hoc um, waterfront discussion, uh, waterfront west discussion last year as well. I don't want to go on and belabor a lot of the points. I think that's the problem when you're last is I agree with a lot of what was said by the counselor from Ward 1 um, and in general having been on the ad hoc and I know having a conclusive document didn't mean we all um, came to the same place. Uh, we, we had to come up with something at the end of the conversations but a lot of us had to uh, we moved on and voted and may not have gotten everything we wanted. And I think still as a result, you still hear a lot of issues here that we're bringing up again. And in terms of this list, I'll echo again the sense, uh, I guess most of it is one, I, I can't go past item one on height, density, uh, massing, resiliency, for sea level rise, which does mean a lot to me, and I mentioned quite a bit um, during the ad hoc. Um, I, I, I was one of the advocates that didn't, that was very much in favor of having 150 feet or more away from the, the river and the, the waterfront. Um, that wasn't popular, but I, I still firmly believe, you know, if you look at this picture and the boat slips, you know, we didn't talk much about the port aspect of Newberry Port, which is really a, a piece we would lose. And so um, I am eager to get the conversation going. I'm not going to belabor, but a lot of things that were said, I, I completely agree and would like to kind of move on on how we're going to make this work. Thank you. We're trying to decide if we just move on to the next topic and leave this where it is, um, or if we need to make some conclusions at this point. There just seems to be a lot of um, distinctions between where the planning board is and where the city council is. That's about the highest level observation I can make at this point. Um, I don't know how we're gonna take this forward. Um, Andy wanted uh, a little more help and considerations for where the um, next revision of this ordinance would go. But I think we're going to have to mull over all the notes we've taken and what we've heard from people. And it might be better if we cover more of the topics at this point. Looks like there's energy to do that. Am I reading everybody right to go on to the next topic? OK, we will start with city council. And the last shall be first. And this topic has, been, um, uh, has not been um, alluded to yet, so we're going to jump to some different way of thinking um, from what we've been talking about, because we thought it was really important to look at the zoning and permitting and the relative or distinct roles between the city council and the planning board, um, approve who and how do they participate in the approval of the master development plan and the site plan review. Um, what is the agreement, the timing and content of the d uh, development agreement that has been referred to, uh, reference, but nobody has um, come up with any uh, information for us about when we're going to see any of it, and um, issues around the possibility of appeal, phasing, major and minor, and um, planning board review versus planning office. I know this sounds um, administrative, but we're talking about a zoning change here and a big piece of the zoning that helps to regulate what gets built anywhere has to do with the procedures and processes that we use to make that happen. And if, there are, if that's not clear, then we'll be tripping over each other. And this zoning, as it's written right now, is very unclear. And that's why we wanted to have comments on these topics right now. 
So we'll pass the mic back down to a froze. I can't believe we have one mic here in this long table. Um, yeah, so I mean, this is a, it is a big change. I think the zoning and permitting aspect that has traditionally been in place for um, a lot of this type of development is uh, driven largely by the, the planning board and the planning, um, the, you know, things coming before and trying to find uh, guidelines and, and rules and regs. I think part of the, the, the reason we see something different coming up here and, and clarifying a role of the city council is there is an aspect of this project that I think from other traditional projects that we look back on that have been done that may have been um, maybe had not the outcome that people may have wanted, there was a need to see if there's something that can be done that can incorporate a, a perspective of the people that the city council has. Now, with that said, we definitely, I don't think there's a need to bring a additional burden or create any kind of loopholes or situations where we would find uh, it difficult or one group having more power than the other. So for me, I think this conversation and hearing from some of the more um, informed people too on, on what's best practices on how something like this could be done incorporating all the right viewpoints uh, will be important to hear. But I, I think there's a reason why uh, some of the aspects were written in here in terms of understanding the role of these key entities. Um, so it, typically, um, the city council doesn't have, you know, they don't participate in, in you know, something that goes to the ZBA or the planning board or the uh, planning department. Um, at higher, th this is an, a unique project, and um, it, the planning board and the zoning board are appointed and then approved by the, or, or confirmed by the city council, they're appointed by the mayor. There is a role for the elected body in some of these larger decisions. Um, and, and a lot of communities do do it that way. Uh, the city of Peabody, for instance, the city council has to issue a special permit at the end of, they're at the end of the process for a number of different uh, business enterprises, including restaurants. And it's just their way of, of you know, putting the last, you know, stamp of approval on it and having that be done by um, the elected body uh, who's, who's supposed to be responsive to the residents and the people who elect them. Um, so uh, the other part that um, I, I had some concern with was the ability of, you know, and the notice that would go to residents, once again, um, that I talked to in the first one, it, we, we need to make sure that this is as like our current process as possible that abutters, you know, so, so that people aren't just learning, have to learn the new process for this one, you know, uh, development. And so there should be notice to abutters and, and the abutters should have the same level of participation uh, or more so than they do now with our regular uh, ZBA and planning board process. Um, trying to look at some of the other things on here. Um, that's about my input on this. I don't, possibility for appeal and phasing, I'll leave that to other people. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> yeah, I, th I think that uh, overall uh, that there, there are two things that I'd like to say. One is that um, I think because of the uh, potential to, um, to change in a rather dramatic way um, the way in which our downtown appears and, and the way it lives, um, the way uh, we relate to it, um, that the responsibility for much of the permitting should rest with uh, a group of elected individuals, and that would be the city council. Having said that, I'm a little bit concerned that, uh, that, that in fact, the, the, the great expertise of um, the planning board um, might not 
bubble to the surface if we don't incorporate the planning board more directly into that final decision-making process. Um, I think in the past when we have uh, made a change to our zoning, uh, we've, we've followed an orderly manner, and that's what we're doing now, and that is we have a zoning proposal before us. The planning board and the city council talk about it together. Uh, the planning board makes a recommendation, and then the city council uh, acts on that recommendation um, before a final ordinance is passed, which of course then has to be signed because it's a law by our mayor. Um, there are diff different permutations there. If the mayor doesn't like it, the mayor can, uh, can reject it, uh, send it back to us, and it would take a two-thirds majority to override uh, the mayor's objections. Um, so I'm, I'm interested tonight, without expressing uh, an opinion on the details of how that might take place, I would like to hear what the planning board, what the members of the planning board uh, suggest uh, because they have the embedded expertise in, in the details of, of development issues. Um, I'll also say something about the development um, uh, contract or agreement that is, is uh, being uh, drafted with the assistance of special counsel. Um, it is, I want to say imminent, uh, I can't say tomorrow, this week, next week, but certainly within a couple of weeks' time, we will have some clarity on some of the external benefits that are not part of the development itself per se. There are certain things, mitigation measures, that the developer, should something go forward, um, is responsible for. If there are upgrades to water and sewer service to that area, the developer will have to do that. If there are infrastructure improvements on the site themselves, on the site itself, that need to be adopted, that's their responsibility. Um, they have to uh, respond to some of the constraints of, of uh, traffic and circulation, both uh, vehicular and, and pedestrian on site. That's their responsibility. Um, but then there are some other things that people would like to see done. We'd like to see some changes to the base of the Gillis Bridge. That traffic gets all snarled at the base of the bridge when the bridge goes up and down in particular. Uh, that end of, of the city is paralyzed until the bridge is open and traffic flies back and forth over the bridge in a, normal, in a more normal pattern. That's something we think that uh, any development uh, is going to have to help us address. Um, and, and there are other things. There's a laundry list of things that people might, might propose. Um, the list of things that in addition to those mitigation um, items uh, is fairly limited, but I think will have some significant impact on the way we view the overall benefit, which has to be balanced against the, um, the concerns we have about a development this large. Um, it's coming, uh, but I'd like to hear from the planning board tonight a little more about how they view the process. I don't have anything further to add. I think my colleagues have said it better. Yeah, I'm going to reiterate um, that um, I do recognize the um, expertise that we have in the planning board. Uh, and in general, the planning board does give a recommendation to the council on, on all zoning changes. And I, and I, and I think uh, the planning board um, must do that. Right? We need to get that recommendation. And also, um, so, so that... that um, I, I, and I guess that that does impact the order, all right? So the planning board would act first and then or simultaneous to the planning and development committee, as is the case. Um, the, uh, I, I think in this topic, we're also uh, talking about uh, whether we're going to uh, have a master development plan uh, versus uh, a special permit uh, process or whether we would actually have both I guess is still in the consideration um, uh, you know I, I see the attraction of a master development plan but um, it, in that it, that it would allow us uh, to have as, as a community more control over the overall um, look of the project uh, I am concerned however that that um, we would lose some, that through the, the planning board would lose some control over the details. What that does, if we do have a, do approve a master development plan, it means that we really, really have to get it right. 
uh, and and um, if we're not going to also have special per, uh, permits allowed. Um, I think that's it. I'd like to talk a little bit about phasing um, as well. Uh, uh, I think I think we need to to have some real specifics on on the phasing, what comes first, how long it's going to be laid out, uh, what the priorities are, and I'm kind of think of the hotel when I have that in mind. Um, thank you. To keep it as brief as possible, in general, philosophically, I generally don't see a role for the council on permitting projects. I think we have a planning board, we have a zoning board, we have processes. But to say that without acknowledging that this project is different is sort of, would I mean, we're sitting here having a discussion about it that probably doesn't happen on many other projects or areas in the city. So this is different, and the reason it's different is you already know why. It's size, right? The size of the site, four acres. It's location downtown. I think that the potential impacts from the project um, probably uh, have a likelihood to extend further than what you see in a typical project. So in a, you may have a project come forward. It may have an immediate abutter effect, of course, may have a neighborhood effect. But this one, we're sort of talking about like the circle keeps going out and out into everything from our sewer treatment plan to our water supply to our downtown traffic to our downtown businesses and so forth. So it's expansive. So while I, I did hear from the, the public comment last week, some people think the council you know, doesn't have necessarily a role on some of these things. I think this one is different and it, it requires perhaps a different way of thinking, which is kind of where we're at with this whole thing. The, the, the next thing I want to say is that it's, it's, this is part of what makes me nervous about this whole process, but the, it's so complicated. It's so complex. We're trying to pull off like the deal of a century uh, and write the most ironclad master development plan of all time that somehow we're going to anticipate everything that's going to happen in the next 40 years, maybe even 100 years, depending on the time frame you use. And so to that end, which as you know, I've already said what I would prefer, which is to go back to a simpler thing and try and figure out what the core problems are and solve a couple of them instead of rewriting the whole movie. But if we go down this path, it's basically impossible to separate out the zoning and the development from the deal. And so if, if the council is going to be the one to negotiate the deal, then we have to be part of that discussion going on. My Ward 4 colleague said the right word, which is exactly what I was thinking, which is phasing was probably the number one of the number one concerns in the deal, what comes in what order. And so when you're, when you're permitting a, a specific part of it, um, I, I do think there's a role for the council to be in and in that discussion and have a part of it. Now, with all that said, which is the phrase of the night, with all that said, which is usually when you say the opposite of what you just said. I don't want to say the opposite. What I want to hear is what are the loopholes and problems? Because when I read this zoning, to me, it seemed like the city council, the deal was we, we dealt with the MDP, the master development plan, which is the deal. And I, I think that makes sense. That's what the city council does. We do this all the time on all sorts of things. And the planning board retained all the control and, and the discussion and deliberation on the looks of the buildings, all the things that the planning board, A, does all the time, B, has expertise in. So what I'm not clear on and I would like to hear about is where are the loopholes, where, where is the lack of clarity, because that isn't what I was, it, it seemed clear to me that there was a delineation. We're probably not going to be talking about building facades and window fenestrations. That's not how I took our role. I took our role as, is this, is this phasing in line with what the original deal was, or are we getting off track? So I, I guess I, that's what I would like to ask the, my colleagues on the planning board. Can they explain where are the holes in the, in the drafting that are um, obviously deficient and need uh, repair? Thank you. So, it was my, so I've heard from a few former planners recently, and the development agreement is typically signed before the zoning is even completed being voted on. So, I mean, there are a lot of things that I think we, we're just not used to because this is really a large project. It is one of the largest ones we're probably going to ever have in the community. It's the last piece of land we're going to have. So, I guess my one thing that I want to make sure of is, you know, throughout this process, as long as the public still is able to have their public comment and they're part of the process throughout, that's what makes the difference to me because I think the abutters do have a right to have their say in this matter. I mean, I think the folks at Horton Jard you know, they are going to be impacted by this development more than anybody else. So that's my two cents. So I think, I think one of the things that, that needs to be said is just to sort of back up a little bit so people understand. There, there is currently a zoning in, in that area right now. And if NED wanted to build within the current zoning, and we all wouldn't be sitting here, 
um, they'd be dealing with the planning board and moving forward with some type of a project. But this zoning has to do directly with what's on the pictures in front of me and on the screen behind me, I believe. And the idea is, is once you need to change zoning, you've now put the city council in motion because that's what we do. And we put now the residents are now all involved because we represent you. So the people of Ward 5 are now involved with this um, because I represent them. And that's how this is all working. And I, I agree with the Ward 1 counselor. I, I don't, being, being a member of planning and development, I, I um, go to the planning board for advice and help on you know, what zoning should look like. And we do this all the time in our committee. But I don't decide on what windows should look like or clapboards and things like that. That's the planning board's job. That's not our job. Our job is the zoning and they advise us on what they think is best, and then we bring it back to the council to change the zoning. That's what our job is. Um, you know, should there be a development agreement? Absolutely there should be. Um, should it be done before the zoning's passed? Yeah, that, that is the general, uh, the general idea of it. Um, and you know, this is a big special project, if you will, so it, it certainly should have a development agreement and there should be some value for the city on you know, what, what the city's going to, um, to, get, to gather out of this. But I just want people to understand that there is zoning in place and they're asking to do something different and that is what has activated all of this. Um, I think I can answer the question because in the interest of time, I hope uh, the board doesn't feel they have to answer it, but the MDP, the Master Development Plan, in the current draft of the zoning does not say that it's a special permit, so I think you could solve all of it by just saying it's a special permit, so it's subject to all the state rules of a special permit, the same notice requirements and so on. As far as uh, standards that the city council would use to grant the special permit, and again, the idea is you have one special permit for the whole overall project, and then individual buildings would go to the planning board for fenestration design, all that stuff, uh, under a, a site plan and architectural review. But um, uh, the current zoning doesn't have any uh, extra standards. I, again, uh, let's, let's not kid ourselves that the current zoning is great. It, it's okay. Um, yeah, all it says is uh, the planning board will approve a special permit under the usual special permit criteria. So <clears throat> just bear that in mind. Special permit is the way to go. Uh, my other colleagues already talked about why the city council for this particular project probably wants to weigh in. You know, I, I, I will say, I mean, because we're elected um, and we're not all appointed by the mayor, I mean, we have a different uh, viewpoint. We're under more pressure. I think it was Ted Jones who testified last week that we're accountable, and um, especially in an election year. That's just so bear that in mind. Um, but actually, you know, all that being said, um, <clears throat> if you write the zoning right it, uh, uh, correctly, um, it shouldn't really matter. You know, who who's reviewing the uh, special permit. Um, so, you know, and that's where we started this evening, which is, doesn't look like, at least for some counselors, we're close on, a, on an ordinance. A um, couple more things. Uh, on the development agreement, yeah, of course they're done concurrently, and that's the whole idea. Is it's a quid pro quo where um, you, you're, you're figuring out, well, what kind of zoning are you going to allow, and then what's the master development plan? It's all done together. I mean, when I've done these before, on the developer side, all three are approved at the same time. The, uh, any zoning change, any development plan, special permit, and the development agreement. Because the quid pro quo is the developer wants to know that it has a vested right for a period of years to build what was just approved so that things don't get changed on them. But the city needs to know that they're going to get the public benefits that were promised. As far as it, uh, how do we get there, I, I think what Councillor uh, Connell was getting at is we have not gone in a closed session yet in the City Council on our negotiating strategy. The actual form of the agreement is not that interesting. It, you know, there's remedies in there in case the developer defaults or we default. But, you know, I, I wouldn't want to, I mean, again, we may never get there, but I wouldn't want to do openly here and say, well, this is how we're going to negotiate with, with uh, NED. And if they say that, let's go to this. 
That's not usually what you do in open session, that's all. Um, uh, as far as phasing, um, I think the phasing goes in both. The um, uh, special permit, the, the master special permit, I'm gonna call it, and, uh, and the development agreement, you have to bind them. And those are material terms for the city council, last I knew, and not least because of what Councillor Tontar was saying, which was the hotel. Um, you know, uh, oh, way back when, um, Councillor Devlin talked about tipping point. Yeah, I mean, again, we, we can't do that in open session. We have to meet privately with our advisor on, you know, what do we think the negotiating point is with NED. Um, uh, major and minor modifications. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to have a mechanism. When you have a, an overall, projects always change, always. And the longer that the development agreement is, you know, say it's a 10-year agreement and the project's phased out over that period, and the larger the area, the more likely it's going to be that there are modifications. So it's really just a question of where do you draw the line. Um, the rule of thumb in Boston is a 10% variation. We don't have to use their rule of thumb. We can use any rule of thumb we want. But you can't have nothing. That's not wise because then everyone has to go back and do this all over again. So you got to have something. And usually if it's, unless it's really an amendment, it never goes back to the legislature. Uh, so that's enough. Let me start on um, the development agreement. Um, we appreci I appreciate that it has to be negotiated um, with the developer in, in private. But I think my message is do it. Get, the, get it negotiated so we can all talk about what you've agreed or what you feel is the best agreement you can get with um, the developer. Because until we have confirmed the benefits that the city's going to get out of this development, there's no point in passing or even considering passing zoning. Um, I don't think we should adopt zoning if we're not clear what it is we're going to get from the developer for all the reasons that have already been described as a complex, um, central, um, huge development for the city. Um, and so I think um, having that in, in place before the zoning is voted on is very important to me. Um, back to the issue of planning board and city council and our roles. It's true, um, city council absolutely um, votes on zoning changes or voting, uh, zoning um, changes or amendments as they're known. And the city and the planning board makes recommendations. Um, what's different here is that the master development, and so that would happen with the zoning. And that's what we're doing right now, as a matter of fact. We'll make our recommendations, we'll be part of um, creating the next round of the zoning amendment, and whatever goes to city council will be part of that. Um, the master development plan is what's different. Um, it's required in this case for what I just said earlier, that it's a very complex um, development, and not only the developer, but we want to know what's planned over time, and that makes a whole lot of sense. Um, but the master development plan is not a special permit, and I don't want us to get into language where we can just quickly turn around and say this is a special, what did you call it, uh, Councillor Eigerman, master or special permit. I don't want to throw words around. Special permit means something very specific. Um, one of the possibilities that we should consider is what at least three other communities in um, uh, Massachusetts have done, and that is to have a master development plan adopted by the city council with input from the planning board, um, and a special permit process the planning board uses afterward to ensure compliance with the master development plan. And the reason we say that rather than um, the review process that's being proposed in the current um, zoning is that it gives the city, through the planning board, more control over any changes or any adaptations within the overall master development plan that may be necessary to make with the developer as we go through the review process on their applications. So um, we are working for the city. City Council is working for the city. We're all on the same side of the table. You guys ought to be sitting up here with us. Um, we're all working toward the same goals. And we want to make a um, permitting process um, allow that to happen um, as efficiently and as effectively for the entire community as possible. Um, 
I guess my, my, my comments are really regarding the, um, how we affect the zoning as a planning board. And um, I feel strongly that we are involved in the process um, because it will come back to us through the special permit, I believe, is the case. Um, and my concerns are really about um, having a process where we are um, reviewing the minutia that we do review, which is similar to what was passed in the 40R, so that we're talking about facades, building materials, building heights, et cetera. And um, I'd like to make sure that we, as a board, are part of that um, and have an effect on the zoning. And that's really all I have to say about that. I do agree that um, the public and planning board and city council need to see the three documents simultaneously. The um, master development plan. And I wonder if somebody can clarify. Uh, I read a master development plan submitted by NED. And was that document their intent to meet the zoning um, provisions for that application? It's still a question I don't have answered. Um, if the answer is yes, I would say that application is woefully inadequate for uh, a permitting process. And that um, what this project definitely needs is the kind of oversight of a special permit. I uh, have great respect for our city councilors. They are elected officials. This is a very, very important project. And it's why they are the authors and approvers of the zoning. But beyond that, I don't know if there is A, time, <laughs> or B, the expertise to undertake uh, the permit granting that will be required for this project. Um, in terms of bu public benefit, we're, we're all waiting to see what's in the goodie bag from the development agreement. Um, but I would not want to sacrifice the gem of our waterfront for what might be some short-term benefits. This is a very serious project for the entire community for, for all time. Uh, relative to phasing, uh, I think the hotel, which is one thing that the public uh, really talked about a lot last week, and which I personally believe our community needs, should be required in either phase one or no later than phase two of the plans. And that should be nailed down in both the zoning and the development agreement. Um, I guess those are my comments, thanks. Okay, first, um, the development agreement. I, it's really essential that the development agreement be executed by the landowner and approved by the city council before the vote on the zoning ordinance, uh, just so that's nailed down. It does, it's not really related to the master development plan, it's really related to the zoning change. And so that's, it's important that, the, that it be locked in so that the only thing to do after the zoning is to execute it uh, on behalf of the city, which I probably believe the, the mayor would do. Um, we have to be very careful about what we, what we ask for in a development agreement. The more we ask for, the bigger the project has to be to pay for it. So it's really, you really can't draft a development agreement unless you know what the scale that you want in the zoning is. They, they really have to be worked on together. So in some sense, while the development agreement is being negotiated right now, that's fine. But uh, when we come back and decide what the scale of development that's allowed through the zoning is, uh, the city council may very well have to go back and, and revisit the development agreement and, and perhaps scale back their asks. Um, the development agreement really has to address, I, I, for me, the primary thing that the development agreement would have to address, aside from the, um, the uh, procedures and, and phasing and so forth, is off-site traffic conditions. Uh, that's, that could be a condition where there's a public benefit that be, goes beyond mitigation of the direct impacts of the development. We've got problem, uh, problem intersections downtown, particularly at Route 1, and that really has to be fixed. We can't add traffic to it without, without fixing it. Um, the, the master development plan, the, you know, I, th I think before I came into this meeting, I thought I knew what the process was, and, and now I'm more confused. 
When I read the ordinance, the proposed ordinance, it says that the master development plan can't be submitted until uh, approval of the zoning. It can be submitted simultaneously with or su subsequent to the adoption of the zoning. So you're, the way the ordinance is written now, you actually can't adopt the master development plan at the same time as you adopt the zoning. It also says that the master development plan is going to be adopted in the same process as adopting a change in zoning, which means the city council has to refer to the planning board the planning board holds public hearings, and not until after the planning board's hearings are completed can it go back to the city council for, for action. So it seems to be a much, you know, much stretched out process than, than what, we've been, what I've been hearing tonight. Um, the, uh, I think that the city council, first of all, I understand the rationale that the city council should be involved because it's a very large project. But the key change that's going to be made is the adoption of the zoning. Once the city council has adopted the zoning, that has made the major change to this area. And the master development plan is really a implementation of that zoning. So if the city council wants to go through the whole process twice, that's their choice. But it, it's a, it seems it's a duplicative process for the same thing. And I, and I really um, wonder about the timeline in terms of how the city council is going to do this. And think about multiple meetings over a series of weeks, uh, and each meeting might spend an hour, an hour and a half on this project. Uh, from my experience, that's what you need to do to go through a, a project of this scale, and I've done that. So think about the business of the city, the normal business of the city council, and can you add that process to it? It's, 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 uh, it's going to be a, a heavy lift, I think. Um, one of my questions about the master development process, the way it's written, is it's an administrative approval under zoning. Uh, it's not a special permit, as we've talked about uh, right now. So, and, and the reason for that is that uh, New England Development wants to avoid the possibility of appeal. Um, at least that's a primary reason for it. Now, my question is, is the Master Development Plan approval a legislative action because it's designed to follow the process set forth in Chapter 40A, Section 5 for adoption of zoning, or is it an administrative function? And if, if it's an administrative function, would the city council then be an administrative official so that somebody could appeal the decision to the zoning board? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of questions about the way this is written. Um, now, unlike a special permit process, there's no time limit on the amount of time that the planning board um, has to review it or approve it. Uh, unlike, the, unlike site plan review, there's no requirement that the master development plan ever be approved, regardless of whether it complies with the zoning ordinance. And it also, the ordinance, as we've said, doesn't contain any standards or criteria. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, lot of unknowns about this process, the way it's drafted. It's a very, very unusual process. Um, I've dealt with projects of this scale, and, and I haven't seen anything quite like this. Um, the, and I should say, the master development plan is not an either or special permit or master development plan. As, as I think has been mentioned before, uh, the master development plan can be approved by a special permit. Uh, one final thing I think in terms of this is there's a question about determination of completeness when a, uh, when a master development plan is complete and so forth. And it's, uh, it's in the ordinance it's written that the de determin that determination is, is made by staff. And I think for something like this, it's a determination as to whether the planning board has enough information on which to make a decision. I think that is really the planning board has to make that decision, whether it has enough information. Not, that shouldn't be... Uh, left to a staff decision. Uh, so I have some of the same concerns um, as others. Uh, I think the way that it is drafted, the planning board is left with this BLAR approval, um, which the acronym <laughs> probably needs to change. Um, but it, the role of the planning board seems to be you know, dealing with aesthetic and architectural details, um, not the actual planning. Um, there are people on the planning board who have a lot of experience um, with city planning and development projects, um, and it seems a shame to me to not use their expertise a little better. Um, a big concern with the ordinance, the way that it's drafted, is, like Rick said, there are no standards. Um, you know, did and it doesn't say 
on what basis the city council would approve or disapprove or if they can disapprove as long as you know what um, has been submitted is complete and complies with the zoning which doesn't seem particularly detailed um, so I think there needs to be standards put in there whether it's adopting the same standards as you would apply to a special permit um, you know maybe that's the answer that as Jared suggested um, you know, would fill in a lot of the holes. Um, small comments. Uh, the BLAR approval doesn't appear to be discretionary. We have to approve um, as long as it conforms to the master development plan and is compliant with the zoning. Um, so there's not a lot of discretion on the part of the planning board. Um, and one thing that I noticed, the planning board can hire consultants for to do peer review but there's nothing in the um, ordinance that gives the city council the ability to do that. So, those are. <clears throat> I'm not gonna belabor it. I think that the <clears throat> other members here have, have, have made some good points. Um, I'm just gonna say two things. One, it's, it's not, you're right, it's not uncommon. Sometimes there are city councils who do act as a special permit granting authority. Um, but as Rick said, it, it does um, add a layer. Um, it's, it's, it's another complicated factor when you're looking at development to have to go to city council. And I think that um, if you look at some of the bigger projects that we've reviewed, I think that you know, we do take the time just to listen to all the public comment and to look at the peer reviews. And it, it, it does take a lot of time that I don't think the city council necessarily has that that um, they have a lot on their plate. You have a lot on your plate. Um, I think that um, the um, I, that being said, if, if the city council wants to be the special permit granting authority, I think this has been my comment, then then take it. That's fine. So I don't want to be the one who's who's approving a minor modification um, and trying to to um, understand your intent. I think you take it. You be the permit granting authority, and you you run with it. Um, I, I also just want to say that um, a planning board is not a design review board. Um, I, I think that we don't just look at fenestration of windows and, and sort of how facades look. I think that we have a lot of experience um, on, on land use decisions and development, and we look at a full development package. So, um, so I, I, I don't like being minimized as sort of that that type of a board um, with our skills. So I just want to make that clear that, that we do have um, we do have great designers and, and I'm not one of them, but um, but I, I do listen to their to their feedback and then I also listen to some of the other my other colleagues and, and what their expertise is as well. My name is James Brueger, planning board. Um, thank you. I, you <laughs> said said it very well. Um, I think the only comment I have is uh, I have 35 years of uh, medical device development and trying to spec something, trying to spec a great design, that doesn't work. I mean, it, a spec is necessary for a great design, but it needs the work of the uh, engineers and marketing people and everything to create that. And that's what I, th my sense of this project is, is that we're losing that, we're, we're basing everything on a spec, and I think we're going to lose a lot without having the planning board involved in the special permit process. Um, if you have something you'd really like to say, you think that's going to facilitate because we're going to have to um, close this off, um, this topic. So. I just, I just have two things I want to say. One is um, I, I'm interested to hear more about the standards for approval. So in my experience being on the council, the challenge is when you start talking about what are the standards for approval, you invariably get into actually what people think about the underlying topic and the discussion ends up going nowhere. So when we talk about standards for approval, I think there's different ways to think about that on the council. In other words, if we said, well, the standard should be that um, you know there will be X percent of affordable housing, that's a policy decision, and then we start sliding down, and unfortunately, because it's an abstract discussion, it becomes impossible for us to come to a conclusion. Typically, in my experience, this is just telling you how, how I've seen it, we have that discussion as we're doing, doing the task, and then we have to come to something that enough people can feel comfortable voting for. I, I did want to reply to that. I think when we think about land use and when I think about other things like zoning boards and you know this substantially not more detrimental and these other standards that we think about, that's a little bit different. When we're talking about a development agreement or MDP, we're sort of weighing out public priorities. 
And that's not, I mean, they're all important. They're all number one, right? And that's part of the problem with the challenge. So I just, I wanted to respond to that. And the second one is probably more important to me because it's very illuminating and I'm glad we're having this conversation. It's, it seems like some planning board members are sort of waiting for us to do a development agreement. And, and so I've been thinking about chicken or the egg since the mic went down that way in terms of what is the order and people have different expectations. My take on it is, um, you know, so, so it was said, okay, do, this, do the development agreement so we know what we're doing. And I'm saying, let's do the zoning so we know what we're doing. And I'm, so I'm coming from the other side. I'm thinking, well, what's the zoning we can live with? And then, yeah, we'll go get the best deal we can for that zoning. I just wanted to say that I think that's, that's my way forward anyways, because if we go the other way, then we're doing the handout zoning, right? I've got my handout, I want something, and therefore I'm gonna end up backing myself into a deal that I basically can't live with. Um, so I think uh, Rick mentioned this as well in his way, but I wanted to say that I, I, I can only speak for myself. I don't see a DA coming. There's no development agreement coming next week or next month. I'm not even aware that it's under discussion because I haven't been part of that discussion. I'm waiting personally to see the zoning we can live with, and then we'll have to go see if, if, there, if, that's, if there's a public benefit package that makes sense. Um, but I, I value the, the density and the height first as opposed to the public. So I just wanted to say that just so we're communicating about Yeah, I, I, I think uh, there's a, uh, Rick made a point about, well, um, if it's being negotiated now, that's fine. So I want to clarify, it's not being negotiated now. That we haven't, what I was saying is we haven't even, as a city council, given any direction to planning staff or our special counsel, our lawyer, um, Rebecca Lee, um, of uh, wherever she works, that, uh, Mince Levin, that, uh, you know, these are the things we want you to ask for. There are no negotiations going on. So, and I, uh, so that, I just want to make that clear. <laughs> nothing, nothing has happened. Let me just clarify at least my concern here, and it may also resonate with other planning board members. Think about the scenario that if um, we recommend and then you adopt uh, city councilors um, the zoning, the next day, the applicant can come in with an application. And all we have is the zoning to go with. We don't have the development agreement. So I think we have to think very carefully about chicken, egg, or um, um, simultaneous decision making here. Um, in one community I know of, they had, it was a town, and they had on the town meeting warrant the same night the development agreement for um, up for uh, a vote, and they had the zoning up for a vote. The first one passed, the development agreement passed, the zoning did not pass, so it was moot. But we want to, my perspective is that we don't want to be caught with having zoning in place, an applicant with an application submitted to us uh, as the city council and planning board reviewing it right now the way the zoning is written and we don't have a development agreement in place. So I leave that conundrum open to why we're talking the way we are about it. Okay, so are there any final comments on this before we wrap up this topic? Yeah, sorry, I forgot to say. So uh, Rick had asked, well, what is the development agreement? Is it an administrative act or a legislative act? It is a legislative act. It's a legislative act uh, subject to veto by the mayor but it's, it's a legislative act. At least that's the way I've, I've done it before. And that's quite deliberate because it's, it's not appealable to the Board of Appeals. It's a contract. Um, and we authorize, only the city council can authorize real estate deals. So it's the same kind of thing. That's all. Um, all right, so we're gonna take public testimony now. I think what we'd like to do is, please, uh, if you've spoken last week, if you could not speak tonight um, so we can give a chance to those who were excluded or, or missed it last time because uh, it's almost nine o'clock we've been at it for two hours so we do want to give you a chance uh, to speak for two minutes if you didn't speak before um, just name an address and off you go and come share the mic with the rest of us Uh, my name is Mark Gay, and I live on uh, 14 Shandell Drive in Newburyport. Can, can you hear me? Over here. Uh, Mark Gay, uh, uh, 14 Shandell Drive, Newburyport. Um, two points. 
I have here. And first of all, I just wanted to mention what Barry, Con what Barry Connell mentioned before, the concept of we all need to change. Uh, the bottom line is, I think everybody here knows what change is, after, and especially the age of some of the people here, including me. It's not a question of change. It's a question of what's good change and what's bad change, okay? So, and, uh, and no, we don't have to get used to it. We've all moved here, and we've paid our taxes, and we've, you know, uh, complied with the zoning ordinance, and we expect other people to do that. And this is a change of, of, of law, specifically for one applicant, okay? So in my background that I just wanted to bring up here, 20 years ago, we had a major hotel case on the waterfront. I was the lead attorney for, for the appeal on that. And I represented Sonia Marashian, Chris Snow, and the Citizens for Open Waterfront. That hotel was going to be built 120 units on the central waterfront. We, fent, we spent five years in appeals court. The, the takeaway from that whole thing was the people of Newburyport as a community, number one, did not want a, a, a hotel on the central waterfront. They wanted it off the central waterfront. And number two, the people in Newburyport wanted it downsized. The 120 unit hotel was too big. And that was the takeaway. And I think everybody since that time has enjoyed the waterfront and all the benefits of the waterfront, of an open waterfront for this city. So fast forward to today, and we have a situation where, yes, it's no longer on the central waterfront. It's being proposed off the central waterfront. So you can check that box. And people always wanted a hotel. It was just a question of the size of the hotel. And, that's, and so here we are today where New England development comes in. And that's right. So, so New England development comes in and basically goes from 120 units to a 110, 100 unit hotel plus another 215, so it's 300 more, 300% bigger than what the city of Newburyport originally had. Rick knows that, Rick was around there, and, and you can, all you have to do is read the front page of the papers for those five years. So this is a major, major density problem. Fast forward to, in terms of the, uh, sorry? Okay. Well. Uh, Okay, and just fast forward to today, everybody has been using to the concept of the new ink. But, oh, you didn't tell me that in the beginning. So, so you can't do that at, at the end. Uh, you didn't, I didn't hear that. No, you didn't say that. I, w I wasn't here last week. I, okay, sure, I wrap it up. Everybody uses the word New England development here, but I looked on the application and it says, it doesn't say New England development, it says uh, New England uh, Management LLC. I looked it up at the Secretary of State's office. Then what the company you're dealing with, New Report Manager LLC, is a manager of limited liability companies, the trustee of nominee trust and or general partners of limited partnerships that directly or indirectly through subsidiaries own and operate real property and or operate trades and businesses in New Report, Essex County, Massachusetts and, and, and other related or unrelated lawful businesses. So has anybody done any due diligence on this kind of Russian sort of uh, egg type of concept and how many layers or you have to go back to really find New England development. And where that's important is when you have to do any compliance or any enforcement with this company. Is it a shell company? Is it a, is it a, is it a conglomerate? And anybody knows that when you're dealing with having to deal with multiple entities, is there any asset there in case there's a major liability problem? So everybody keeps using New England development. You're not doing business with New England development. You're dealing with a front man, okay? So it's really important you figure out who you're doing business with because bad things happen. Piercing the corporate veil is very, very difficult. Uh, New England Development or whatever shell company they are. Uh, Al Sanchez, 18 Riley Avenue, Newberry Report in South End. Uh, they bought most of the land in 2005. At that time, they put plans in uh, 2004, 2005, that are much smaller, lower building height, and less mass. That should be the starting point, not where we are now. Thank you. 
Hi, my name is Bill Bushy. I'm from uh, 62 Boardman Street in Newburyport. Um, just a couple of quick points here. Um, it seems to me that you need to make a clear recommendation about how you measure the height of the building. I've heard several, several different people here tonight talk about that. That seems to be point number one. Um, you need to make a recommendation for the maximum height of a building along Merrimack Street. You know, the people are going to be most affected by when they're walking along Merrimack Street or when they're on the waterfront. So you need to make a recommendation about the height on the Merrimack Street and on the waterfront, and everything else in, the beach in between can take care of itself. Um, you need to make a recommendation for how far you're going to, how much of a setback you want from the waterfront. You know, how much, how much room are people going to have to walk down there? Make that as a clear recommendation. Um, you need to have a recommendation on whether or not you're going to fill this site for flood protection. All right, you can have that debate, whatever you're going to end up doing, but that's got to be a clear recommendation because that's before you can move forward, you need that cleared up. Um, number six, residential parking. You need a clear recommendation on how many spaces you're going to require because, you know, you can't go into this, and, you know, with, without a clear recommendation there. If, if, if the developer comes in looking to squeeze 500 parking spaces into a space and with only 300 spaces, it's not going to work. Um, and with regard to the question of the tipping point on whether or not this is going to work for the for the developer or not, I don't think that really matters. You know, I mean, clearly he'd rather, if he can spend $50 million and make $50 million profit or spend $150 million and make $150 million profit, he's going to do the latter. You know, I understand that, but that doesn't mean that we should take a bad deal so he can make more profit. All right, so focus on what's right for the city. Don't care about what the developer is going to make, how much money the developer is going to make on this. That's all. So my name is Mike Young. I live on 22 Charter Street. So the, this uh, ordinance bothered me a lot, so I talked to some people uh, at the state, a mass uh, DEP. Uh, I'm going to read a couple of things from this uh, Massachusetts general law. Uh, it's based on uh, a 1641 Massachusetts colonial law, so it's been in place quite a while. Chapter 91, it's all about water, by the way. Chapter 91, waterways regulations encourage the use of the waterfront for water-dependent uses, such as recreational boating, commercial, fishing, lobstering, shipping, commerce. Water-dependent projects are therefore presumed to have a proper public purpose. Non-water dependent projects, on the other hand, are not presumed to have to serve a proper public purpose. This is the law I'm reading from. Another part, if any part of a project or use site, no matter how small, is considered non-water dependent, then Mass DEP classifies the entire site as non-water dependent. That's exactly what this site is. Now, you can go on their site and you can get this map. And this map shows this same thing that's up there. And I know you can't see it, but there's five separate parcels. And they go from the river to within about 10 feet of Merrimack Street. And every one of these parcels is under, will require a chapter, chapter 91 license. Michaels has a chapter 91 license, and each one of these will require a chapter 91 license. Um, and there's nothing given that says a chapter 191 license will be granted. One last quick thing. Chapter 91 regulations require that non-water dependent projects must provide greater benefits than detriments to the public's rights in waterways. This language to me is very, very clear. So I suggested to, one last comment, I suggested to the mayor a couple of years ago that the best use of this property would be um, a public harbor, something along those lines, the water that's always been used by the people of Newburyport for 400 years. And I suggested that she ask CARP to donate the property to the city. And she said, no, 
it's a train on the tracks, it's gonna happen, we're not gonna ask CARP to donate. I would suggest that you guys ask CARP to donate this property to the city and the city make this a proper harbor and marina and focus on the water, which is the reason why people come to Newburyport. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Ken Swanton from 10 Tremont Street. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I also appreciate all the information you have on the, on the uh, city's website. I've been through a lot of it. I was very happy to find those 3D um, drawings where you can zoom in and look at things. And when I looked at the one from the bridge, and kind of, that's the one that if you zoom in, you can see this development more clearly in the very large buildings. It just doesn't feel like Newburyport. The buildings are so large. You know, the downtown is three stories, four stories most, but mostly three stories. And this is, just feels much larger. The buildings are large and blocky. I know you've talked a lot about density. Uh, and I just, another voice adding on the density thought here. Um, you know, about a half a century ago, folks in your chair uh, kind of do dodged a bullet when they were about to bulldoze the center of Newburyport. And, you know, I, I don't want to be overdramatic here, but I think you could dodge another bullet right here. I mean, if you approve this level of density, what's going to happen next? I mean, the same landowner owns Michaels owns the, the Black Cow. It's in the same district. I'm not quite sure how this four acres works, but can they come in and ask to build buildings right there instead of those buildings? They also own the Point. They own the uh, that old, you know, oldies antique place. I doubt they bought it to be in the antique business. If this flies, will they then ask for Waterfront East? I mean, don't set a precedent here for this level of density in Newburyport, please. Hi, my name is Jeanette Kresawati, and I live at 22 Charter Street. And um, thank you for all of your um, your good input. It's you've answered lots of my questions tonight, and I am in. It's good to follow this gentleman because I'm sort of in his ballpark about um, this landowner and this developer who owns phenomenal amount of property in this town, and. He can choose many other spaces. We have empty buildings. He has fouls. Fouls is in disrepair. Infrastructure is in disrepair. Go be, go do something sustainable. Beverly is building a microtel in the old apartment building next to the Cabot Theater. They're choosing to use buildings that are in already in existence. And it's fabulous. The Salem, the town of Salem has done the same thing. The merchant the Salem Hotel, they're all buildings that are existing that Mr. Karp owns. So let him be a responsible landowner and use the property that he already owns versus taking up the last vestige of open waterfront that we have in this town. He has many choices. Plus, he's also left so many of his properties in disrepair. Our town is looking sh is shabby. It, no, we have friends in Portsmouth who come here and say, your buildings are empty. It's apparent. And he is a major contributor and controller in this town. And he can change things in our town by using the existing property and make it be something sustainable than an empty, old building in disrepair. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna close the public comments section just for tonight. We're leaving the planning board, the, the meeting open. Before we continue it um, and close the meeting, the planning board would like to take just a couple minutes, maybe even less, to approve the minutes from last week's meeting. That will then allow us to post those on the website for everybody's review. So can I have a motion? Did you have a question? Um, oh, that's right, because it's another part of the meeting, sorry. So we will vote first to continue the meeting to October 10th in City Hall Auditorium, City Hall Auditorium. yes. 
Um, not that this isn't a lovely space, but uh, that's more central. So I have a motion from Rick, what? To continue it. Uh, uh, Rick will uh, motion, second. James seconds it. All those in favor on the planning board? And uh, do they need to also do it? Well, you, you do your thing and then get back to us. Go ahead and finish your thing. Yeah, while we're on the topic, why don't you guys vote on it? Okay. I'll entertain a motion to continue to October 10th. Uh, motion to continue to October 10th. Second. It's a motion, second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.